Virginia Tech gets by Richmond in unimpressive fashion. Virginia gets drilled once again by an ACC opponent. And finally, down goes Clemson. All that and Aaron McFarland's puppy chow this week on Teal and Barber. Welcome in to episode 60 of Teal and Barber, the Richmond Times Dispatch, and Richmond.com's Virginia Tech, UVA, and ACC Sports Podcast. I'm Mike Barber, ACC beat writer for the paper, and joining me as always, my co-host, the 13-time Sports Writer of the Year and the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, Mr. David Teal. David, how are you? Good morning, Mike. David, you and I both got to cover, uh, got to cover is an interesting choice of words, but (laughs) Virginia's performance against Wake Forest, a pretty resounding beating, but you had quite the adventure, I believe, trying to leave (laughs) because you you did the double dip. You you covered UVA Wake, and and then while I slept in Saturday morning, you took on uh, Tech in Richmond, but David... Tell us a little bit about your driving adventure. Yes, I was I was literally deer in the headlights as I was driving on 64 westbound toward my hotel in Harrisonburg, which was the closest hotel I could find. I'm on 64 west around Waynesboro, riding the right lane, not a care in the world after midnight. And all of a sudden, here come two headlights at me going the wrong way on the interstate and i'm like oh my and it took me a while to process it and to think okay yep he's coming at me he's going the wrong way but thank god he was not driving erratically he was keeping it between (laughs) the lines and we just passed each other in the night and I uttered a few holy <laughs> and went on my way. You know, it's funny because I, I've had that happen. And there is that split second in your own mind where you're thinking, is he going the wrong way or am I going the wrong <laughs> Right? Isn't there that moment where you're like, okay, somebody's screwing this thing up. Yeah. Is it me or is it him? Yeah, well, I knew I was going the right way. <laughs> Because I, I've made that drive literally hundreds of times. But no, it was it was a little disconcerting. It, it, and, and, you know, on the interstate, there, there's more speed. We uh, When I started my career, as I've mentioned on this show, I, I worked in Harrisonburg, where you ended up staying that night uh, at the Daily News Record. And, and Main Street through Harrisonburg um, is one way. It, it splits off, essentially. Yeah. Uh, one way, and, and then there's a row of, of buildings, and then it's the other way, the other side. Um, and it's sort of a rite of passage to A, uh, do it wrong when you first get there <laughs> and be the guy driving the wrong way. And then to be kind of sitting at a restaurant or bar, one of the places with the, the little outside tables and look up and say that something's wrong. Wait, that car's going the wrong way oh on a one-way street. And, uh, you know, we can laugh when nothing terrible comes of it, but certainly that, that can be a little scary, a little uh, jarring, I'm sure, especially at that hour when I imagine you were a little bit sleepy. No, I, I, I really wasn't. I tend to be pretty amped up after a game. Uh, and I and I had the satellite radio. I was I was listening to my Channel 49 Soul Town on, on, on Sirius XM. So I, I was plenty awake, and trust me, I was really <laughs> awake after that. that. That'll get you. That's like the cold bucket of water to the face when you need to wake up. Uh, well, David, like I said, you, you were doing all this extra traveling because you were headed down to Blacksburg to, to cover Virginia Tech and Richmond. Uh, so let's start there. Let's start with the Hokies. Okay. They followed up a disappointing loss on the road to West Virginia with a pretty – unconvincing win over Richmond. All due respect to the, to the Spiders, who I think have a, a very good, especially defensive front. Um, but they played most of that game with their backup quarterback uh, after Joe Mancuso's injury. If not for a big punt return for a touchdown by Tavian Robinson, Richmond might have gone all JMU on Virginia Tech. So, David, what did you take away from that? Well, I don't think Richmond was going to win the game, Mike, simply because the Spiders couldn't score. It's <laughs> a problem. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, once Mancuso went out, which was the Spider's second play from scrimmage, he gets yeah. loose on a scramble for, I believe it was 29 yards. Mm-hmm. And it was a very benign looking play to, to everyone. Justin Fuente took note of it after the game and 
just you know the, the hit wasn't bad, but cl- he landed wrong. And as it turns out, as as our John, as our teammate John O'Connor has has since reported, Mancuso broke the index finger on his right or throwing hand, and he's out for several weeks. And Bo English, the uh, the transfer from Air Force, who by the way is enrolled at UR's law school, <laughs> came in, and you know he he wasn't phased and you know ran some nice option, but he his inability to throw the ball downfield evidenced by the fact that he completed 15 passes for 77 yards. Yeah. That's almost hard to do. Yeah. To I mean, get that, that, that little production. That's barely five yards of completion. So the Richmond wasn't going to, to, to win the game and it's only touchdown came on a 16 yard drive after Knox Kadem threw a, a hideous interception and we'll get to that in a, in a little bit, but yeah, the, the, the Hokies have issues on offense as, as we heard both Justin Fuente and coordinator Brad Cornelson <clears throat> say yesterday in their media availability, uh, Cornelson said, we're disappointed three and one and we're disappointed. Yeah. And, and disappointed because I, there was a lot of hype for this offense and, and a lot of hope maybe is even a better word. Um, you know, these guys were high on Braxton Burmeister. They were high on Raheem Blackshear. They were high on Jalen Holston, Trey Turner, James Mitchell, obviously, who they lost for injury. Um, I think they had high expectations for this offensive line, which obviously has dealt with some inconsistency, some injury. They've had to move some people around. Let's move away from the Richmond game. We're in the open date now. Big picture, David. How do we feel about the Hokies? Because Hey, they are 1-0 and in the Coastal with a pretty important win over North Carolina. If they can get their stuff together here, they're in a great position moving forward. They are, but getting their stuff together with Notre Dame and Pitt mm-hmm. on deck, th- that's, that's a challenge. I mean, Notre Dame just cuffed around Wisconsin at Soldier Field on Saturday. Now it got a, got a little out of whack late with a couple of pick sixes to, to inflate the final margin. And we'll know more about the Fighting Irish after their home game Saturday against Cincinnati. I, I kind of like the Bearcats to get them. I think Cincinnati's really good. But still, you know, Notre Dame coming to coming to Lane Stadium for a primetime game October 9th and then followed by an October 16 home game against Pitt, you know, a team that absolutely boat raced the Hokies last year. And Kenny Pickett leads the ACC in touchdown passes. I believe at last check, uh, Pitt was still leading the league in sacks. And you mentioned the Hokies offensive line issues. So, yeah, I mean – like pretty much everyone in the ACC, it's hard to be sold on Virginia Tech. Yeah, probably the biggest selling point, you're right, is the lack of anyone else to believe in in, in, in that side of the conference or really the entire conference, and we'll talk more about uh, that later. How about specifically Braxton Burmeister at quarterback? Because there were high expectations. He's done some things well. He noted after the game, yeah, yeah, missed some throws, missed some reads, but also made some plays with his legs. Um, you know, I, I think – what they get from Braxton Burmeister the rest of the way may be the key. In fact, I asked Justin Fuente how he feels about his starting quarterback, and this was his answer. I've been proud of Braxton. He's, comp- he's been incredibly competitive. He has taken care of the football. He's given us chances. He's made plays. I do believe there's another level of efficiency and play that he can reach, and it's our job to help him get there. And I know it's in there. I believe it. And we've got to continue to, to tweak and turn things and coach and and help him along so that he can be the player that he that he wants to be. Yeah, the player that he wants to be is the player that they want him to be. Uh, it, it might be what's missing right now from this offense. David, he's proud of Braxton. He believes in Braxton. Do you still believe in Braxton Burmeister? It's early, so I'll 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 give him the benefit of of the doubt. But the early returns are not encouraging. They're they're just not, and he's he. He did talk about missing throws, and he's missing too many. I mean, he had Drake Dulius down the sideline on a wheel route the other day. Should have been a touchdown. He's that open, and he overthrows him. I know mistakes happen. You you can't hit on every one, but when the dude is lonesome open, let him catch it. 
at the least, even if you don't lead him and he has to wait a little bit, you know, ma- make sure you get him the football. And it, it, it's plays like that, that, that just aren't happening. And yes, Brad Cornelson and Justin Fuente said all the right things yesterday about we believe in him and we know it's there. We just have to get it out of him. Well, then why did they go to Knox Kadem the other day? If if Braxton Burmeister was humming along, you would not have seen Knox Kadem on his own six-yard line the other day. And if that's the case, that makes it, and we, we may talk about this a little bit more later, but that may make that decision even more befuddling because the reason supposedly for playing Knox Kadem was you need to get him some live reps. And, and I agree with that because David, we're sitting here talking about how Fuente and Cornelson are, are, you know, throwing their support behind Burmeister. They believe in him. He's the guy. Well, what choice do they have? They don't have another, yeah. they don't have another quarterback. So I think part of it might be, Hey, I agree with them that they need to get Knox Kadem some slightly more meaningful reps. Now, deep in your own territory in a game that's already not going well, that ain't the time to do it. And, and again, we'll, we'll get into that more later. But that was, to me, uh, that made no sense. But what Burmeister can and cannot do going forward is what this offense can and cannot do because none of those other guys are ready to play. And I asked Brad Cornelson this, part of this open date may be tweaking the offense. And, and I've been asking a lot about James Mitchell and replacing him. And are there plays that come out? And, you know, the players all say we can do anything we did with James Mitchell with these other guys. Well, that's not true, right? James Mitchell was yeah. a special talent and, and that's not a knock on, on Nick Gallo or Drake Dulius. I mean, they're good tight ends. James Mitchell was a hybrid special kind of player. Um, and I think they've realized some things that Braxton Burmeister does well and doesn't do well. You know, I thought it was telling on Monday, when Justin Fuente said, um, in answer to my question, we didn't we didn't use that part there, but he said, you know, emotionally, he felt like maybe Braxton had played more football than he really had because he's an older kid. I mean, he he played some at Oregon, transferred and sat out. Then he was injured, played a little bit. He hadn't played a ton of football. Um, and, and Justin Fuente admitted, you know, maybe maybe he thought he was a little more game seasoned than he actually is. I think that's fair. But you know what else the Hokies need, Mike? They need some receivers other than Trey Turner, Tavion Robinson, and Caleb Smith. You know, all throughout preseason, we heard about these young wideouts. You know, specifically Dwayne Lofton and and Jaden Payhu. And thus far, you know, the two of them have a combined one catch for minus one yard. Yeah. You know, that's... <laughs> They they need to get them better in this open date, and they need for them to be more of a factor going forward because they're wearing out the other three. Absolutely. And if you go back over uh, the, the Fuente tenure, and, and I'm not blaming Justin for this because I know it's something that, that he and Cornelson have worked on, but um, at the end of the year, they usually have a pretty limited group of guys who were regular pass catchers. In the first yeah. couple of years, they had some studs, right? Superstars. You had Isaiah Ford, you had Bucky Hodges, you had Cam Phillips. So kind of, okay, you know, do you really want anybody else on the field when you've got those guys? But as time's gone on and they've been supposedly building up this depth um, and they always say they feel better about what they've got uh, on the two deep, we're still not seeing other guys catch the football. And, and it has been a nagging issue for this offense for the entire time Justin Fuente's been here. Yes, to- totally agree. And it's completely counter, Mike, to the offense that Fuente and Cornelson had going at Memphis. Right. But the vision of this offense, and, and I, I still think it's what they want, is eight deep, nine deep yes. at receiver, guys rotating in, moving fast, putting the ball in the air. You know, you catch a 60-yard pass, pop off the sideline, somebody else comes in, makes a play, you pop back, um, and they just have not developed or recruited uh, well enough to do that at Virginia Tech. And um, so that kind of remains to be seen where will they go with that vision. One more thing on Tech, and, and I don't want to knock this group because I think they've been good, but the defensive line, absolutely dominated the game against North Carolina. And that's not an offense it's easy to do that with because they get rid of the ball quick. Sam Howell's a pretty heady guy. You can recognize where pressure's coming from, uh, veteran offensive line, all of those things. I thought we were in for a year where they do that to everybody. Now, it hasn't really happened the next three games. Not that they've been bad, not that they've been a, a liability in any way, but Middle Tennessee State, Richmond, 
I just thought Amari Barno is going to have six sacks combined in those games. Taiwan Garbett's going to be making plays all over the field. And, and, and those guys have made some plays, but they haven't taken over games. Are, are you surprised or, or am I uh, being a little too harsh with what I expect from them? I think you're being a, a little harsh, but I, I, I agree that there hasn't been the production off the edge that you might have expected, especially after the opener that, that you referenced. Where I think Tech has been really good up front is at defensive tackle. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've got a nice four-man rotation there. I, th- I think Jordan Williams, the Clemson transfer, has been really, really good and getting better with each week. I just seem to notice him more and more as as the games go on so i think that's a, a really nice trend it, you know and to have four and maybe even five you know if, if will panay uh the, the young man from europe uh c- continues to develop you know that could become a five-man rotation but i really like what the Hokies have there but but no question they're going to need to to get more pressure especially when Kenny Pickett and Pitt come to town. Right. That's a guy, and we've seen him do it to the Hokies, who if yes. you let him get in a rhythm, uh, he will – Pickett will pick you apart. And so, yeah, I, I think that's um, – Something that needs to improve. You know, Justin Hamilton, I asked him about this on Monday, and uh, part of his answer I thought was was really insightful. He said, you know, Amari Barno is the kind of guy who can wreck you by coming off the edge, and sometimes teams confront that by going right at them, right, by running the ball at them, by taking – so he doesn't have space to operate in. Um, And that's an interesting point because I do think teams have adjusted strategically to the fact that, dude, Amari Barno shows up when you put on the video. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's a bottom line business, Mike. The bottom line is Virginia Tech was allowing about 32 points a game last season. Through four games this season, it's less than 16. Mm-hmm. Yep. Defense isn't the problem. And Justin Hamilton, uh, after a rough you know, first go of it, and we've talked about all the obstacles and things working against him. Uh, it seems like he's got that side of the ball uh, a little back to, to maybe vintage Hokies defense, and uh, that's a good sign for Tech going forward. We mentioned Tech is off this week. UVA, it might it might wish it was off this week. Uh, they are not trending the right direction. Certainly uh, not defensively. No, not at all. The Cavaliers have been blown out, right, in back-to-back ACC games. Uh, they followed up that, that 59-39 drubbing they took in, in Chapel Hill against North Carolina with a, I'd say, equally, if not more discouraging, 37-17 home loss to Wake Forest. Uh, unlike the UNC game, the offense and defense, I thought, were both Pretty unimpressive in this one. Uh, UVA is now 0-2 in the ACC. That's a pretty big hole to be in. Uh, so, David, what did you take away from from the wake loss? Well, there was, there was a lot of things, none of them good for the orange and blue crowd. To, to me, Mike, where the, you know, and th- this can be said for many games, if not most of them, this was decided at the point of attack and witness the fact that Wake Forest had six sacks and UVA had none. Now, I know that Sam Hartman and Wake, they go quick and he's going to release it. And that's that's how they protect him. So you're not going to get a ton of sacks on the Deacons. But they just, Virginia allowed him to be way too comfortable. He throws for 270, three touchdowns, no picks. The Deacons were also able to run it. And then poor Brennan Armstrong, if he wasn't just a a, a daggone escape artist, he'd have been sacked a dozen times the other night. Yeah, it was impressive (laughs) how good he was at getting out of the trouble that his team was was putting him in. And, um, you you know, it's going to be interesting going forward because, again, like we said at, at Tech, the offensive line, David, is supposed to be this veteran group that they've been developing over Broncos tenure, uh, Coach Two J, um, you know, taking in all the criticism for all these years, and this is when they're gonna gonna see the payoff here. And, and I thought they've been good for most of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought they've been really good for most of the season. They were really bad Friday night. Did they have a bad night, or are we getting ahead of ourselves thinking that they've really arrived? That's going to be a big question going forward. No doubt. And you know, t- two road games coming up you know, mm-hmm. Thursday night. At Miami, 
a second consecutive short week for Virginia, which is really a big ask, especially when you're on a a two-game losing streak. And then uh, a a Saturday date at Louisville, where, by the way, the Cavaliers have never won. And they haven't won in Miami since 2011. So these are back-to-back places that have been very cruel to the Cavaliers. Uh, So big picture. David, are, are we done with UVA? Are, are we ready to put him in the ground? Or or with the way Brandon Armstrong is, is capable of playing and the way that offense is capable of scoring, do we still think that this can be a bowl team? Can they pull themselves back into what figures to be a mixed-up coastal again? What, what are we expecting? Yeah, I, th- I think they can, Mike. When, when you have a quarterback who on, a, who on an off night and a <laughs> lot of empty calories late, I get it. But he still threw for more than 400 yards the other day. And he still has Dontavian Wicks. And he still has Jelani Woods. And he still has Billy Kemp. He still has Keaton Thompson, albeit playing one-handed with a with a broken left hand. Those are those are a lot of weapons. So I mean, I've got to think Virginia's gonna be able to score moving forward starting Thursday night. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, Miami beat Central Connecticut State 69 to nothing. But until the Hurricanes tackle somebody who's a a real team, then I'm not sold on them defensively in the least. You know, entering that Central Connecticut State game, they're the ACC's worst tackling team, most missed ones in in the conference. So I think this is a, a golden opportunity for Virginia to right itself offensively. The question is defensively. As we were remarking in the press box, when you take into account the entirety of the North Carolina game and the first seven possessions when Wake Forest scored the other night, Virginia went 19 consecutive series without forcing a punt. That That's mind-bending. I mean, that's bad on an astronomical level because I mean, we know if, from watching these teams play offense, I mean, it doesn't take much to derail an offensive possession and you end up with a punt, even if you're having a good night. Yeah. And, and Virginia couldn't even luck into a stop. Um, bad penalties that extended drives, bad penalties that showed lack of discipline. Um, the thing that's interesting to me, Bronco Mendenhall came out after the Wake game and he said he thought the defense was better. So I went back and, and watched both games again, which it's kind of like Clockwork Orange. That you got the guy with the eyes being held open there, and and he wants to look away, but he can't. I rewatched North Carolina. I rewatched Wake Forest. The only better that I could discern was that against North Carolina, they gave up huge, big Chunks. plays. Big plays. Yes. Wake Forest, the buzzword for coaches, it's like when, when baseball managers say we were pitching to contact. Uh, the buzzword for coaches, they made Wake Forest earn it. They made him earn it up and down the field. Well, I watched. It, it was very hard to earn it. They ran for 203 yards. They did get the one long touchdown. Uh, there wasn't pressure, as you mentioned, on Hartman. So, I don't know. Making them earn it in that weight game, I don't know that I saw it that way. Other than, yeah, it wasn't 40, 50, 75 yards at a clip like it was against the Tar Heels. It wasn't all of that much work to move up and down the field, um, albeit in smaller pieces. David, I was less encouraged than Bronco by what I saw defensively in terms of improvement. Well, my only reaction when we were sitting there in his post game and he said, I thought we played better defense tonight was the bar was so low <laughs> a after point. Carolina when you gave up more than 10 yards per snap yeah. that you couldn't help but be a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good point. I guess maybe that was the uh, grading on a curve uh, that he was doing right there, and, and maybe I maybe I see his point in that regard. But hey, the offense and the quarterback play that does still give them hope, and and that brings us to this week's edition of Who You Got. Thank you, Mike. As we expected, the ACC's quarterbacks have been really you know the star of the show this season. Brennan Armstrong leads the league in passing yards and total offense. Uh, Pitts, Kenny Pickett. Leads in touchdown passes and completion percentage. UNC Sam Howell, uh, NC State's Devin Leary are right there. So looking forward, who will finish with the strongest year at the quarterback position? Who you got? Let's start with David. How do we measure strongest year? That's that's an interesting discussion all in, in itself. If we're looking at just numbers, if we're looking at the team's success, I'm going to side with Kenny Pickett. 
I mean, what, this is his 10th year of college football, some, something along <laughs> that, those lines. I mean, by, by the time it, the end of the season, he'll have more than 40 career starts at, at, at Pittsburgh. And he's, you know, he's never thrown before this season. I believe his career high was 13 touchdown passes in a, in a full year. And now he's at, what, 17? I mean, he's just crushing it. And, <coughs> excuse me. And again, you know, schedules skew things. And they beat New Hampshire the other day, 77-7. to And he threw, I believe it was six touchdown passes. But New Hampshire, hey, like Richmond, is a quality CAA program out of the championship subdivision. And, and the Wildcats were nationally ranked going into that game. And maybe that's what Virginia Tech should have done to Richmond, is hang 70 on. But uh, I'm going to side with Kenny Pickett. So Dave's got the experience with uh, Pickett. Mike, who you got? All right, so I'm going to figure that the way I'm looking at this question is who's most likely to be atop my ballot for first-team all-conference quarterback when it's all said and done. And I still think that guy is going to be Sam Howell because, one, he's trending in the right direction. Right. I mean, he, he has been finding a groove, both running and throwing the football. I think Carolina gets it figured out and ends up having a decent year, not the great year that maybe some were, were projecting. Um, and recency bias, I think that Sam Howell is going to play better at the end of the year, uh, which means he's going to be more up there in people's minds and and probably mine too. So I think Sam Howell at North Carolina, you know, it's interesting that, that neither of us have tipped toward Brennan Armstrong, who has been maybe not just maybe the best quarterback in the nation, let alone the ACC early on. Certainly statistically, his numbers are just through the roof. Um I think I don't. I won't speak for you, David, but for me, the play of the offensive line gave me pause there to think. Yeah. Okay, is this going to last? And another thing that we haven't talked enough about on this show: Brennan Armstrong hurt his knee against yes. Illinois. It was not a catastrophic injury. It didn't take him out. He has not been the runner he was before. Agreed. Virginia has not called the runs they called before. I think that is affecting him, and I think it's affecting this offense. Oh, Mike, you are spot on. And not only that, not having Armstrong or a healthy Armstrong in the run game. And then the other night, you'll notice Keaton Thompson's mm-hmm. absence from the run game because of because of the ha- broken hand. Yep. Those are two – they don't play running back, but those are two – those are Virginia's two best running backs. <laughs> college football players as they like to label them. That's a great point. And, 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 you know, it's funny. I talked to our good friend, Bob Shoup, the former defensive coordinator at, at William and Mary, and he's a defensive analyst now at Miami. And, um, I, I was asking him about, you know, the lack of a traditional run game. And, and one of the things he said, and, and Manny Diaz may have said this too, it's, it's, it's an untraditional, a non-traditional run game, uh, mm-hmm. but it's effect. Um, Thompson runs the ball hard and, and they do different things. And, and yeah, that, that's been, that's been missing. And uh, maybe it's been the difference between, Hey, winning two and O and losing O and two. It, it's, it's an important part of that offense. Now, when it comes to predicting winning and losing, I know who, who we got. <laughs> it's our <laughs> next guest. We are joined now by our friend and the outstanding sports columnist from the Roanoke Times, coming to us from a casino in North Carolina. It's Aaron McFarling. Aaron, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Mike. Yes, I am enjoying a nice uh, quick getaway during the Hokies bye week. I will be back by Wednesday, but uh, this is uh, my happy place down here at Harris Cherokee. So I'm enjoying I'm enjoying life. I hope people took our upset of the week last week, took NC State and ran with it. Hope they took the money line. Hope you're making some money out there, gang, because uh, that's why we're doing it. If you're following along with Aaron's picks, you too could be on a little mini vacation right now. So yes, f- follow our man and let's get right to it this week, Aaron. Uh, you know, you mentioned the Hokies are off. UVA plays a, a pretty desperation Thursday night game at Miami. Uh, they haven't won in Miami in a long time. They're a four point underdog. So let's start with that. What do you like there? 
<laughs> I joked, you know, we do picks for print too. And I, I joked that, uh, you know, that Twitter saying retweets don't equal ind- endorsements. Well, neither does this pick. I mean, I, I wish I didn't have to choose either one of these sides right now. I mean, just the way <laughs> UVA's defense has been playing. And of course, Miami struggles are very well documented. Uh, back-to-back weeks, my ACC pick of the week was Miami's opponent. Um, and I knew that the odds makers would adjust and they have, I mean, it's only a four point line here, you know, and Miami is at home. So, and it's a Thursday night. You think maybe they could get a decent atmosphere there. Obviously not as good as it would be if they were four and O or something like that, but I still, I still favor Miami here um, a little bit. So, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of a shot in the dark. I'm, I go with Miami 33, UVA 30. I, I think UVA will be in this game because Miami's not that good, but uh, it's hard to it's hard to take UVA the way their defense has played the last two weeks. Yeah, or the way their defense has not played, not shown up. Uh, which right. brings me to another question I have about this this line, and it's the over under, which I saw at sixty two. Now, Aaron, the last three years, this game total has been thirty three points or less. It was thirty three points last year, twenty six and twenty nine. Uh, it's been a low scoring tight affair the last three years Vegas doesn't think that's going to happen again what, what are they reacting to yeah, that's a good question and, and now that I'm thinking about it more I might want to alter my 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 pick because just in terms of the over under because I you know I, I kind of feel like it might go under here I mean this is uh you know it's a short week you've got uh you know they've been you know Miami's been pretty sloppy offensively it, it might not be uh you know, the shootout that we're all anticipating, but you know, what they, what the odds makers are doing is they're, they're looking at it just the way I did, which is, you know, the UVA hasn't stopped anybody in two weeks. I mean, you've been there both weeks, you've seen it. Um, so, you know, I haven't seen the games actually because I've been covering the Hokies, but I've seen the scores and I've seen how, you know, it, the, the touchdowns just come in bunches. And it's just, when you, when you see that you're an odds maker, you're not going to, you know, care as much what happened last year or the year before that as you do uh, the things that happened in the last two weeks. You don't you do not want everybody to be able to load up on one side or the other. And if you make the over under too low here, uh, people are going to do that on the over. Well, that makes sense. Another line that I was curious about, Aaron, you, you mentioned you correctly picked North Carolina State over Clemson. Clemson does not look like the Clemson that we're used to. Uh, 16 point favorite over Boston College. Now, if you had told me in the preseason Clemson's going to be a 16-point favorite over Boston College, I would have said, sure, that sounds about right, maybe even a little low. Um, but now, I, I, are they just not – are they not believing that Clemson is as bad as what we've seen? Are they expecting Clemson to break out? Is this a slight of Boston College? What do you make of that line? Well, I think we just need to remember, and this kind of ties in with what I was just talking about with the over-under, but – what Vegas is trying to do, what the odds makers are trying to do is get equal action on both sides. And they know that people still believe that Clemson is better than every other dwarf in the ACC. That's just the way it is. The public trusts in Clemson because Clemson is the team that's in the playoff every year. So they are forced to to make the line large enough so that you get some action on Boston College because there's still going to be people – Betting on Clemson, thinking Clemson's playing an ACC foe, they're gonna they're gonna whack them because that's what they do. So I I, I think there's some value in BC here because um, I think you know there will be plenty of people still lining up and betting on on the Tigers, but they have you're right they have not proven this year uh, that they're deserving of. So as a, as a player and maybe, you know, as an odds maker, maybe it'll take another week or two before that, that adjust gets adjusted down before they feel like the public is truly uh, in a position where they're not going to uh, load up on Clemson if the line's too small. And that makes sense. Well, this segment is a-, a max puppy chow. So let's get to your underdog of the week uh, across the board. Who do you like? I'm going to go with the Terps. And you know I'm a Maryland alumnus, but I'm usually a very realistic Maryland alumnus, and I think the Terps are a a terrible bet in most cases. In this case, I think they are a good bet. They are playing on Friday night against Iowa. It is going to be the most vociferous crowd in College Park in many years, as long as we throw out all those games where they play Penn State, and Penn State packs packs the place and cheers for Penn State. Uh, They will be cheering primarily for Maryland. Uh, The students will be riled up. Uh, they're actually having to make some adjustments to their, you know, because they normally don't, they're not like Blacksburg or, you know, 
Miami or a place where they understand that you've got to close down things early and open the lots early. You know, they weren't, they weren't planning to do that. They had to make some alterations um, after people were like, what, you're not going to open the lots till five, you know? So uh, it's going to be an insane situation there. And I think Talia Tagabaloa is a good quarterback. His TD to interception ratio right now is 10 to one. Uh, he threw something in the neighborhood of 400 yards last week against Kent state and Kent state's uh, not a terrible Mac foe. Um, so, you know, Maryland's unbeaten. I think they're going to they're gonna get a reality check eventually. It'll probably come at the hands of Ohio State or whoever. Um, they're going to face a murderer's row here soon. But Iowa, despite their ranking and everything else, I think they go down here. I think this is a 27-24 Maryland victory over Iowa. So take that bet and get yourself your own mini vacation. Aaron, thank you so much for the time, and we'll see you again soon. Sounds good, Mike. Thanks, buddy. Well, last week on this show, as he mentioned, Aaron McFarling did predict that NC State would beat Clemson. And now that it's happened and, and, and maybe there's a opening in the Atlantic Division for the first time in a long time, the Wolfpack won that game 27-21 in double overtime. Where does the ACC go from here? David, we haven't had a two-loss team make the college football playoff. So do we think the ACC is out or is there another team you're looking at? How are you viewing things? I think the ACC is likely out. Is it, is it definite? Certainly not. We're still in, in September, and you never know what's going to happen ar- around the rest of the country. But, Mike, I've, I'm going to write about this later today, and I was looking back. You know, in 2008, the ACC set college football's gold standard for chaos when every conference team, both divisions, all, all at that point, 12 teams lost at least three conference games. That has never happened. Not in the ACC, not in any FBS conference <laughs> since the ACC was formed in 1953. That's never happened before. Are we looking at a sequel? <laughs> you know, I... I I wouldn't say it's probable, but after the first four weeks, I wouldn't say it's improbable. Right. I, I mean, I it's, woke up. It, it, it's crazy. It really has been. I woke up, I think it was Sunday morning, and I tweeted, Coastal Chaos plus uh, Atlantic Anarchy equals yeah, ACC football. And that's that's kind of where we're at right now, David. It's um, You can argue it's good for the league, right? Because it means everybody's in it. And I think... I think the ACC has reached a point where, for the most part, and I know there's some dogs out there, but uh, for the most part, these are good football teams. But I do think it's better for a conference like the ACC to have one, if not two, great football teams. And right now, there are zero great football teams in the ACC. Now, what may save them as we look across the country, I don't know how many great football teams there are across the country. So, if there was a year that was trending towards a two-loss team being in the playoff, <laughs> this this certainly feels like it. I, I know Alabama's out there uh, undefeated, but against Florida, they looked beatable. That happens. It doesn't mean they're not going to run the table and win it all. Uh, Oklahoma, they're undefeated, but their offense has been underwhelming. So it, it's an interesting year and certainly a year where I would be less than stunned if there were some fairly blemished resumes in the discussion for the college football playoff when we get into November and December. Agreed. Although I don't know that Clemson's resume, even if it runs the table, yeah. would, would, would be all that impressive. You, you, you mentioned, Mike, that you, know, you can make the argument that it's good for the league to have everybody in it. Well, the league has been there and done that. I mean, from 2001 through 2012, That's a stretch of 12 seasons. The ACC did not produce a single top five team in the final AP poll. That might be interesting, (laughs) but that's a huge problem. It's an immense problem for perception, for television appeal, for the bottom line, for recruiting. The the ACC can't return to that. Now, can you have an off year where your champion doesn't make the playoffs? Sure. It's happened to everybody except the ACC and the SEC. It's happened to the Big Ten. It's happened to the Big 12. happened to the Pac-12 a lot. But this can't, for for the ACC's health, this can't be an every year thing. 
So who, if you're, if you're Jim Phillips and you, and you got a good relationship with a new commissioner, you know him pretty well. If you're Jim Phillips, whose jersey are you wearing when you're sitting on your couch at home? Who are you rooting for? Who do you want to carry the flag? Because if you don't think running the table gets it done for Clemson, who's the team out there that can still save the season for the ACC? Well, NC State's got the pelt of, of, of Clemson already. Yeah, but they've got the stink of Mississippi yes. State, David. Yes, exactly. That's that's the point. And yes, Wake Forest is undefeated. And yeah, I know we, we both vote in, in, our, in our Lee Enterprises ACC Power Poll, and we both have Wake number one. Can the Deacons sustain that and, and run it out? I don't know if if they're built for that. You know, BC's undefeated, but has played nobody. And oh, by the way, is playing it, it, its backup quarterback Dennis Grossell be, because Phil Jerkovic is hurt long term with, with a hand wrist injury. So as as much as I like and admire what Jeff Halfley has done up in Chestnut Hill, I'm not even remotely sold on BC. So so where do you go? If the ACC is going to be in the college football playoff and we don't think Clemson can do it uh, with the two losses and with the resume, is is there a team that can – is Wake – is it cross your fingers and pray that Wake can, can last for 12 weeks? Or, or or is there just really nobody out there unless chaos ensues on the national level? Yeah, I, I, I really think, Mike – the ACC is going to get to to Charlotte in Championship Weekend, and and best case scenario, its champion is going to have one and probably two losses. Mm. And at that point, you have to have hoped for mayhem around the country. And as you quipped uh, so appropriately on on Twitter, uh, good luck to the people selling the tickets and the advertising. Uh, if you end up with Wake Pit as your <laughs> uh, ACC title game, which is certainly very possible. Before we move on from this, though, David, how about Clemson? Because certainly what what Dabo Sweeney built is remarkable. The run they've been on is remarkable. I don't think anybody, at least nobody I've talked to, is burying this program no. long term. Right? Clemson is still going to be a national factor, I think, for years to come. How about this year? Can they fix this offense that, that David, they lost some some really major stars, Trevor Lawrence, Travis Etienne, uh, Amari Rogers. They, they lost some huge pieces. They've normally been able to reload. Can they fix this offense? And how do we feel about this quarterback that we had such high hopes for, DJ Uyunglele? Well, Mike, Uyunglele is, is last in the league in completion percentage. I mean, that's just not going to cut it. And that's the reason that Clemson is last in the league in scoring, last in the league in yards per game, and last in the league in yards per play. I mean, it's it's just, you couldn't have imagined that the offense, yes, Trevor Lawrence and Travis Etienne were generational talents, but you just didn't think it was going to go south in such a hurry. And oh, by the way, that otherworldly defense is now in a world of hurting because Brian Brzee is Clemson's best player at defense at defensive tackle. He's the best player on the team. He tore his ACL against NC State. He's done. His running mate at tackle, Tyler Davis, the game previous, he tore his triceps. He's done for two months. So all of a sudden, the the the, the guts of of that Clemson defense. They don't have any more. So how vulnerable does that leave them on that side, which puts even more burden on the offense? And what a curious game. Saturday at Death Valley with you know, the, the team that I profess to have no faith in, the undefeated <laughs> Boston College Eagles sauntering in there. No, David, you're not alone because as, as Aaron McFarling mentioned, that's a 16-point line. So um, Yeah, how about Ve- that? Ve- Vegas is still a believer uh, in Clemson. We are maybe a little on the fence. That brings us to this week's edition of Take It or Leave It. Thank you, Mike. This one's just really simple. Clemson still wins the ACC championship. Take it or leave it. And let's start with Mike. I'm going to take it. Um, you know, maybe I'm just a, a sucker for trends and runs, but I, I just, I, I look around the ACC and I don't see a great team. And I think who could be a great team come November? The only team that I think that could be great come November is Clemson. 
right? They they find a way for the offense to right the ship, for that completion percentage that you just referenced to go up, for Justin Ross to really get comfortable again, um, for Will Shipley to get back. He's injured now and, and have the impact we think he can have. Maybe they get a little healthier defensively. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but if there's a team that could be great at the end, I still think it's Clemson. You know, North Carolina, I just, I've, I've soured on. I, I said earlier that I think Sam Howell and that offense will get going, but it just overall, I'm not a believer. I think when it's all said and done, Clemson is still the class of the ACC. That just means a little less this year. Thank you, Mike. David? I agree. I'm, I'm going to take it and, and say the Tigers win a, win a seventh straight. You know, Mike, Mike referenced the, the Tar Heels. I was driving home from the Virginia Tech Richmond game the other night. And I was astonished listening to the Carolina Georgia Tech game. I mean, after Carolina beat Virginia by 20, I thought the Tar Heels had it going. I thought they were going to be okay. And they stunk at Georgia Tech the other night. They lost by 23 points. They gave up 45 to the Jackets. And Mac Brown said after the game he was embarrassed. You know, by his own coaching, by his team's performance, and he should have been. They were awful. So it it's really difficult to, you know, be a believer in the Tar Heels. You know, they haven't won the ACC since 80. NC State hasn't won the ACC since 79. So, yeah, give me Clemson. You know, the team that neither of us mentioned, that's 1-0 and and has the win over Carolina. <laughs> Virginia Tech, I mean, I, again, if – if they get things straightened out on offense, I still think that defense is good. Um, you know, I think if you're a coach, an analyst, a player, you're looking at a commissioner, maybe you're looking for really quality football. Sometimes when you're a sports writer, you just want good storylines. You just want the entertainment. And I think the wide openness here, I think if nothing else, David, it's going to be entertaining. It's going to give us something to talk about. I thought both Commonwealth coaches – gave us something to talk about when it came to how they manage their quarterbacks this past week. UVA and Bronco Mendenhall, and this is going to be the the stump I'm on, I guess, all season. They continue to leave Brennan Armstrong, the most indispensable player in their program, in games late in the fourth quarter of blowouts, potentially risking injury. I don't get it. Virginia Tech, as you referenced earlier, put Knox Kadem, their untested backup, into the game Early on, deep in his own territory, he threw a pick that really kept things competitive in that game. I, I hate them both. I hate both decisions. I hate both moves. I don't understand them. Um, they've been explained to us. I still don't get it. Bronco Mendenhall says, hey, we, we need Brendan Armstrong to set the tone. He's our leader. He's the emotional uh, you know, guy here for our team. He fights from beginning to end, so that's why he's not coming out. I don't think that's a good idea. That's his take on it. Agree to disagree. Justin Fuente. Hey, we need to get Knox Kadem some live game reps. I agree with that. Don't think that was the spot, the situation to do it. Of those, David, which odd coaching decision bugged you more? I think the Armstrong one, because it involves his health. Because not only, Mike, are you leaving your starter in and exposing him to unnecessary snaps, you're leaving him in there with a knee that's not right. Yeah. That that's what compounds it for me. And near the end of the game, the, the Wake Forest game Friday night, as the final series is being played, I'm walking through the stands to go down to the field. And I bumped into some family members of, of mine who are longtime UVA season ticket holders. And my uncle Ralph. On, on on Jill's side, he looked right at me and he goes, what is Brennan Armstrong still doing in the game? It's the first thing he said to me. So it's it's not like we're the only ones who, who are questioning this. It, it, it's a very valid point to make. And as you said, you know, that's a hill that, that Bronco Mendenhall is is willing to stand on. And, and I thought the, you know, Putting Knox Kadem in on his own six yard line the other day was <laughs> preposterous. It's seven nothing. You, you need to you need to get out from the shadows there before you put him in. And sure enough, second snap pick. So not, not only have you, have you given Richmond the underdog hope, what have you done to Knox Kadem's confidence? Because mm-hmm. oh by the way, he didn't see the field the rest of the game. 
Yeah, yeah. The, the risk-reward ratio just wasn't there on the Cadem play. I don't think it's there leaving Armstrong into games. It, that, it's a tough question, right? Because they're both terrible decisions um, that, that I just it, – it's, it's bizarre when they happen. To me, it's even more bizarre when the coaches then stand by them, right? Like if Bronco had come out and said, you know, in the, in the heat of the moment, I wanted Brennan to fight till the end. And I realized afterward, probably not a great gamble. Everybody already believes in him, knows his toughness. Uh, that won't happen again. Then you're like, okay. But the fact that he's like, now I've thought this through carefully, and this is where I want to go with it, baffling. And then the Caden one, Caden one maybe even worse here, because Justin Fuente comes out when he's asked about it and says, I don't think field position had any impact on how Knox Kadem performed. Well, that's not what anybody was asking. Nobody thought Knox Kadem threw a pick because you put him in deep in his own territory. People were saying that's not a great place to put your inexperienced quarterback because of how it's going to affect your team if things go sideways like they did. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if he doesn't under, didn't understand the question. I wasn't there for that. Um, but the fact that he took it as, well, we expect him to execute wherever we put him. Well, sure. But there's a high probability there that he's not going to execute well. That's why he's your backup, not your starter. And in that situation, you know, coaching is a feel sometimes. And you're not showing me a great feel for the game if you think that's the moment to try to get your unproven backup some live reps. No doubt. Well, I, that's uh, that's my rant for today. <laughs> no, I, it's it's and it's a perfectly fine rant, and w- one I think that many many tech and, and UVA fans w- w- would applaud. And hey, so do I. I I didn't get either decision, and I didn't I didn't get the the leaving Armstrong in at, at the end of the Carolina game either. I know you asked Bronco about it that night as as well, but. I would advise you, by the way, not to ask him a third time. I, I would imagine it would go poorly, though he handled it. He handled it very well, saying essentially Both agree times. to disagree. Uh, but you're right. There may be a tipping point there. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll probably, hopefully it's not a topic again, because they're not getting blown out in the fourth quarter of any more games. But uh, certainly that that remains to be seen. But David, thank you for having my, my back on those rants. And thank you all for listening. You can subscribe to Teal and Barber on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find your favorite pods. And please consider supporting supporting local journalism with an online subscription to the TD. You can find special promotional offers available at richmond.com. Today's show, as always, was produced by Dean Hoffmeyer. Teal and Barber is a podcast of the Richmond Times-Dispatch and richmond.com. For David Teal, I'm Mike Barber. Thanks for listening. Be healthy and safe. And please join David and me again next time.